I feel like anybody that's paid attention to anything I've said in the last couple months uh, should know that I'm I'm a Tulsi Gabbard fan. Uh, I am a Tulsi Gabbard fan and supporter. I like her. I think she's genuine. I think uh, she's got some really good policies. I don't agree with her all the time, but even when I don't agree with her, the way she articulates things is uh, is this it's good discourse. It's well done. And I appreciate her point of view and the way she articulates them. Um, and, and, uh, and I think like her whole big notion of like being in service to people, I did a whole 40 minute video about it. Uh, and I released it because she wasn't in the democratic debates and I thought it was important for people to know who Tulsi Gabbard is and what she stands for and why the DNC is actively working on trying to fuck her out of the elections. Um, so, uh, I wanted to talk about a interview that she did on Rising, which is a show on Hill.TV, I believe, uh, with Crystal Ball and, uh, Sagar and Jetty. I think I'm pronouncing his last name properly. I hope I'm pronouncing his last name properly because I, I know, like, people probably mispronounce his name because he seems like an Indian fella, uh, but his last name, Jetty, like, I hope I'm pronouncing it properly because people have fucked up my name and I kind of gotten used to it at this point. But I also don't think it's okay for me to just, like, fuck up somebody else's name, right? Like, I don't want to purposely fuck up somebody else's name because my name gets turned into different shit all the time. Like, Krish Mohan will get turned into, like, depending on where I am, into Krish Mohan or uh, Krish Mahan is, a, is one. Uh, in the south, people go, my hand! They get very excited about it. Uh, Chris Morin, I've gotten that. Chris, um, uh, Monahue, Montanagan, like, people just start adding syllables to it sometimes. Uh, and I'm just like, okay, that's fine. That happens. That's a thing that we have to deal with. Uh, and I'm cool, whatever, you know, like, but I try to tell people, it's cool, don't get stressed out, because the more you get stressed out, the more you fuck it up, but anyway, Crystal Ball, Sagar and Jetty, rising on the hill, they talk to Tulsi Gabbard, uh, and, uh, and they talk to her about Trump's latest tweet about the, uh, attack on, uh, the Saudi oil tanker, and who did the attack, right, and he tweeted something like, uh, America's locked and loaded, uh, and we're waiting on uh, on what the Saudis are saying, who's responsible for these attacks, and then we'll go attack them based on what the Saudis said. So Tulsi Gabbard fired back at him and was basically like, hey, it sounds like you're fucking Saudi Arabia's bitch. It sounds like the American military belongs to the Saudis. That's what it sounds like. And it does kind of fucking sound like that. You know? He's basically saying that we're, we're ready to go. We're ready to fucking ship some people out. We're ready to get, get some warships. Uh, it, 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 and, uh, and we think it's Iran. So we're probably just waiting for confirmation that the Saudis are going to tell us that it's Iran. And then we get the green light, you know? Operation Bald Eagle Balls or whatever, or whatever f- fucking name they need to put to it to make it sound fun and exciting. That it's about freedom and not about profiting off of oil in a different country, you know, Operation Ben Franklin glasses, that's, that's a, that, like, that's what they do, they just name them something that kind of is, that kind of gives you, like, some weird nationalistic pride, you know, Operation Red, White, and Blue Pantsuit, and they're just like, yeah, we gotta go do that pantsuit operation, but really, it's just you're trying to enrich some fucking fossil fuel company. And you're letting the Saudis do it. You're letting the Saudis lead us into that war. And that's what Tulsi Gabbard talked about in her tweet. Is like, yeah, you're letting the Saudis be responsible for it. And this administration, uh, or, or at least the people that Trump has surrounded himself in the administration, are all like, they've all been itching for a war in with Iran itching for it he like bailed out on the nuclear uh Iran nuclear deal because of this and he's got Mike Pompeo the former CIA director right and it's like oh has the CIA ever done anything in Iran 
burr. Like, yeah, they fucking done something in Iran. There's a standard operating procedure on how to run coups based on what they did to Iran in the 50s. And they fucking tried to do that shit in Latin America all the time. All the time. And then you had John Bolton, who's one of the most egregious war criminals, to just be let... We're just letting him fucking run amok. Uh, he's no longer part of the administration, but he was a part of the administration. And I'm pretty con- I'm pretty sure he got let go because he couldn't start wars in the countries that we were, quote-unquote, supposed to start war in, right? Iran, Venezuela. Like, he, ne- he wasn't able to make that successful enough. So... Uh, he, he got, he was, he was, he was ditched. He got fucking canned. Or if he, even if he didn't, it doesn't fucking matter. He's just out in the fucking world and he can do whatever the fuck he wants. The question should be, did they attack? Because that, that was the whole big thing too, a couple months ago when they were being, when they were just like, Iran's attacking oil tankers from Japan and Britain. And everybody was like, are they? Wasn't there an American drone there? And they were like, yeah, but we were just watching. Like, some weird war cuck action. Like, we're just watching to see what happens. It's like, if you knew Iran was going to attack these oil tankers, why the fuck didn't you do anything about it? Right? And it just felt weird. Uh, It felt like the Gulf of Tonkin. It felt like it was another ruse to get us into a war we don't need to fucking be in. That's what it should be. You should do an investigation. And you should do an investigation with a third party involved. It shouldn't just be an American investigation. Because America seems to be real excited about blowing some shit up in Iran. And not only that, too, is... is uh, you can't just wage a war without congressional approval, right? And, the, and the, the way they skirt around it is like, oh, but we're just occupying Iraq. We just, we just, you know, we, we defended freedom in Afghanistan. It's like they do these workaround quotes. It's like, no, you never, you need congressional approval to go to war. And they've never fucking done that. It's just all been, all done through the presidential action. And we've just been like, yep, that's what we're going to do. Unconstitutional shit. But that's that's what she called out. She called out, uh, and and if you're a Trump supporter, you should be against what he's doing with Iran. He ran on a fucking non-interventionist uh, foreign policy. He ran on an anti-war policy that he was going to help people at home instead of bombing a bunch of countries that don't need to be bombed. Like that's what he fucking ran on, and now he's going and doing the exact opposite. And all the Trump supporters is just like, well, yeah, I guess we'll follow it. And it's like you shouldn't. You shouldn't follow it. You should criticize your president and be like, yo, is this is not what you said you were going to fucking run on, dog. So based on that, uh, they they asked her a couple questions, Crystal Ball and Sagar and Jenny, uh, about, uh, you know, what what she brings into the office. And uh, she, she points out that it's her experience uh, with foreign affairs, being a part of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, and and she re- and this is, here's the thing she relates it back to American interests and what people need at home uh, because the first thing she says is these regime change boards that we're involved in um, that have occupied so much of our time so much of our military personnel so much of our money uh, it's like four billion dollars a month in Afghanistan uh, like large sums of money. And she's like, what do we do? Like, we're all of this stuff is just so wasteful. It's just constant destruction. We're not really helping the people. It's not about national security. Um, and she's like, that money could be better spent in creating better infrastructure in America, creating a much better universal Medicare plan for uh, the American people uh, and people that live in this country. You could reform education, right? Cancel student debt, uh, help out the environment, put better regulations. Uh, you could you could use that energy to tax corporations that need to be taxed to help the American people. So all of her foreign affairs interests that she has, negotiating through peace, getting rid of these regime change wars, are all in the interest of the American people because that's who she's ready to serve. She wants to serve the American people. And she talks about that all the time. 
And the way she's going to do that is by is by stopping this wasteful spending on wars that the American people don't fucking want uh, and reallocating those funds to things that we actually do fucking need. That's... I think that's fucking great. We finally have, like, an, an extremely vocal anti-war candidate that's talking about how war has impact on, on domestic affairs. And she, she also pointed out, I thought this was kind of funny, because they were just like, hey, did you watch those debates that you weren't invited to? And she was like, I didn't watch all of it. <laughs> Yeah, because they're all a fucking shit show, right? Like, I watched I watched clips, uh, and my wife kind of updated me on some of them. And she was telling me, like, Kamala Harris just keeps talking about, like, nobody's talking about Trump! Yeah, because he's not the problem, lady. Like, you and your fucking terrible criminal justice policies? Problem. Not having health care? Problem. More people in prisons than ever before? Problem. Not legalizing marijuana? Problem. Like, let's address the actual problems instead of being like, Oh my God, Trump! <gasps> like, that's what the fucking... That's what they do. That's what Kamala Harris was doing. And I guess uh, Mayor Pete, like... Andrew Yang said some shit about giving $1,000 to 12 people or something. And Mayor Pete was just like... Boom. I mean, giving poor people money. Uh, I mean, you're supposed to take what little money they have and destroy their infrastructure. I mean, that's what I did at South Bend. I mean, why would you do? Why? Well, I mean, that's interesting. It's interesting that you think that that's uh, that's that's what needs to be done. Is you you're supposed to help poor people? <laughs> Mayor Pete is not a good person. And then you have Joe Biden. God damn it. Joe Biden can't keep up with his own lies and can't keep up with the, with defending his own terrible records. Like, he doesn't have the brain capacity anymore. And I've addressed that in the past, but he does not have the brain capacity anymore. And the DNC keeps pushing him as the front runner, and they will continue to keep pushing him as the front runner. And it's just a bad fucking idea because that dude is going to die in front of our eyes. <laughs> He's going to have, like, a fucking aneurysm on that stage, man. Like, his fucking brain's going to explode on there because he's not able to keep up. He's not able to keep up with people bringing up his record and how shitty his goddamn record is and him having to defend it through a bunch of lies and, 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 and psychological workarounds and all of that crap. He just it, he doesn't have the capacity to do it anymore. Right, like lying is a young person's game. If I'm being per- it's like, it, it just is. Like your brain works at a higher capacity when you're like 14, 15, 16, even or into your early 20s, and it's way easier to keep up your web of lies. Way easier. And then you start getting older, and people call you out in the lies you said when you were younger, and and it's harder for you to keep up with those lies because your brain's not working at a higher capa- at that high of a capacity. But I thought it was super fucking funny that Tulsi Gabbard was just like, yeah, I, I didn't watch the debates. I don't watch all of them. You know, I watched some of it, but uh, I was too busy campaigning and 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 talking to the American people. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you were. That's fucking great. You weren't doing this democracy for commercials bullshit, you know, that they fucking have all these other all these other candidates do. Like try to try to try to get a get a get a good soundbite to to essentially judge them on for the next fucking eight years, you know. And she brought up how Trump is supporting uh, the war in Yemen, but you know, like he's the he's supporting the war with Yemen, and he's not saying anything about that, and that's not something that's going to be addressed on that debate stage. They started also talking to her about um, joining the Democrats in, uh, I guess, impeaching Brett Kavanaugh. I guess there's something going on about that. Uh, I'm not, I'm not fully caught up on that story, uh, to be honest. 
but I, I was following, uh, if you watched prior road reflection videos, you know there's a couple of them dealing with uh, Brett Kavanaugh and, uh, and what happened with him and uh, Dr. Uh, Lizzie Ford. And here's basically what she said. She said that the whole process was rushed. It felt very rushed. There was a lot of details that were coming out uh, that neither side knew how to address. And it all seemed very forced. It all seemed like a very uh, acts of desperation from both accounts. Um, and it needs more information and better investigation. Like, that's a super great response. That's a fucking awesome response. We should have more investigation on that. We should look into that way fucking better. I like that. Let's do a proper investigation of what happened. You know, let's reopen this cold case and do what do what's actually supposed to be done with cold cases, because it it did it. Look, at this point, regardless of whether you think Kavanaugh did it or not, what was a was was a sexual assaulter uh, or not, do, unfortunately, doesn't change the fact that he's in the Supreme Court with his big boy beers. What we can do is go through the proper judicial process and have a bunch of Democratic uh, representatives and senators and stuff that push for a proper investigation through the FBI and give it the time that it needs to, to bring justice to someone that deserves the justice. That's not a bad idea at all. You know, let's not turn it into an episode of Law and Order where everything has to be wrapped up in 55 minutes. Let's actually take the time to come up with a good investigation for this thing. I, I thought it was awesome. That's a good response, too. Um, she talked about uh, Israel-Palestine. Uh, she talked about the U.S. playing a constructive role in Israel-Palestine. In, in, and I think she was kind of hinting towards a two-state solution, uh, or at least negotiating for a two-state solution. Um, and again, Israel-Palestine is something that I am not hyper well-versed on. Um, I just, every time I read up on something, it's like one side is doing something shitty to the other side, and I think they both are not handling the situation as well as they could. Uh, and again, a lot of it has to be with like how the government is treating the people involved in that situation. And I don't think either government is handling uh, the treatment of people particularly well in that situation. Um, oh, this was a funny moment in the interview. They were like, hey, you're meeting the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi in Houston. And she was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> Whoever said that, that's some fake news that they're spreading around. Because I think she just, you know, everybody kind of gets on her case about uh, about talking to these people. That And look, I think it's unfair to put Narendra Modi in the context of American politics, right? Like, Indian conservatism is a little different than American conservatism. And it's, and it's a lot of different conservative values are different than American conservatism. So... Um, there's things that I think Modi's doing good, and there's a lot of things that he's doing that are are, are not good. Um, the situation in Kashmir, I I'm not fully caught up on either. I'm I'm working on that. I'm working on doing a big piece about that. Um, but I don't think that's particularly a positive aspect of his uh, his administration. Uh, his silence on, on, on violence towards the Muslim community is not a positive aspect of his his administration. But trying to get health care for uh, a billion people, trying to get internet access to a billion people, uh, trying to get modern amenities to the rural communities of India, uh, trying to um, get more voter booths, these are all positive aspects of the administration. I think those are cool things that he's doing. Um, and he's leading a billion people. That's a lot of people. So, you know, I, I think what he's doing is different. It's it's tough. But I think he's fucking up a little bit. Uh, and here's the thing. Tulsi has called out some of the, some of the religious violence. 
in saying that it's not an acceptable way to go about dealing with things. Uh, that the religious violence should be said something about. You should be saying something about this uh, about this religious violence that's coming up. The cow vigilantes and all that sort of stuff that's coming up. The the Muslims that are being uh, attacked in India and uh, all of that sort of stuff is like you should be saying something about it. That's important. She's criticized him about that. But people kind of tire into it. And they're like, well, she's a nationalist. But it's like the word nationalist doesn't fucking mean the same thing in India that it means here. And it depends on, like, what political party you want to espouse to. That's really where the meaning of that word has any sort of validity or power. Because to to the left, it's a it's a negative word here. But to the right, it's a word of pride, right? And then to neo-Nazis, it's a word of let's fucking, uh, you know, hurt communities of color and minority communities and things of that sort. So, it, it, But in India, it's just like, hey, we're proud to be Hindu people. And if you're in India, welcome to, welcome to being Hindu. We'll totally accept you, right? And... It, and again, not everybody espouses to that, but that seems to be the general mindset of what nationalism means in India. There is the idea of the Hindutva. The Hindutvas are particularly great. Um, and there, there is, you know, religious persecution and religious execu- exclu- exclusivism. Uh, I think that's how you say that word. Religious exclusivism. Um, and that's not awesome. That's fucking terrible. Just means you're a fucking you're you're like a club, you know. You're like the Sam's Club of religions, literally. Like you need a fucking card to come practice your faith. <laughs> Get some fucking discounts. The last thing she said in the interview was uh, whether she was going to be in the fourth debates, and as of right now, she has fucking swept the unique donors fucking killing it on that shit and she was killing it in the first two debates she met that shit with ease and then they freaked out because she hammered out Kamala Harris I'm pretty sure Tulsi Gabbard is responsible for for basically stomping Kamala Harris out of the goddamn election good Kamala Harris should not have been there in the first place um but more to the point uh they, they're talking about these DNC approved polls and I think she's polling at 2% or above in, a, in like over 30 polls um, and uh, they keep changing which of these polls they're going to actually accept and which of these polls they're not and they come up with new polls uh, that, that she has to qualify for and in some of them she's not even involved in like her name's not included in some of them and it doesn't make any goddamn sense and she's like, they just lack transparency. Their process is very secretive. Their process is changes to whatever they want it to change uh, it to. Uh, and, you know, it's very frustrating. But she's like, we're going to keep campaigning. We're, gonna, we're, we're not going to stop doing the town halls. We're going to keep reaching out to the American people. So, look, if you don't know who Tulsi Gabbard is at this point, uh, there's a ton of information uh, that the corporate media is not going to give you that the DNC is not going to give you. Um, but I would watch the, uh, the first two debates again and see what she said. Uh, I would I would follow her social media stuff. I would look into her website. Uh, I've done several videos on Tulsi Gabbard. Um, so you can check those out. Jimmy Dore has done several videos on Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, Lee Camp has done some stuff. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm throwing my support behind Tulsi. And, and I'm not saying, like, it's, I'm, you know, like, fuck Bernie Sanders now. No, I like Bernie Sanders, too. I think Bernie Sanders is another important voice to have on that stage. Um, even though when he was in the debates, like, he didn't have his voice, like, physically speaking. He was, like, doing town halls and shit. And his, his voice sounded real raspy. You know, get him a cough drop. Get him a cough drop. It's not, I'm not saying like I'm not going to support Bernie Sanders or, or, or nothing, but I, 
you know, Tulsi's my top tier candidate. She's for she's for ranked choice voting, and if we had ranked choice voting, we wouldn't have to fucking deal with this, right? Because my top three would be like, yeah, I kind of think it, it'd be Tulsi Bernie Yang. <laughs> like that's what I think it would be, and and we could rank choice vote that shit, right? One, two, three, count up the ones and the twos and the threes and see who gets, you know, like what a great system that would be. And she's for that. She's for ranked choice voting. To, to, uh, to help the election process, help, help decrease election manipulation. Um, so, yeah, go check her out. Because I feel like she's, she's like the candidate for people. And if you want somebody that can beat Trump, that can turn a bunch of Trump supporters over to, to, to the fight, to the struggle, to, to be like, hey, a corporatist isn't somebody that you should uh, depend on to fight for your rights... That's your gal. She knows how to talk to conservatives and probably convince them that Medicare for All is a good idea. That it's going to be in their interest. I'm throwing my support behind Tulsi Gabbard. Hey, thanks for watching this video. Uh, this is part of a little series I do called Road Reflections, where I talk to you while I'm on tour uh, about the current socio-political environment, current news stories, uh, debates, that sort of stuff that I don't get to talk about on my podcast, Taboo Table Talk or Forkful of Noodles. It's a little bit looser. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this clip. If you guys enjoyed it, uh, you can find the full episodes on my Facebook page. Uh, you can go like Krish Mohan, uh, social vigilante and comedian. And uh, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. Uh, share this out if you enjoyed it. Um, and another way to help uh, see more regular content is by becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash Thanks again, guys, and we'll see you on the road.